All right, so I just want to just share one of my favorite parts about living in Colorado. We moved here about eight years ago. Uh, it's the mountains, it's the outdoors, it's getting out. So on Labor Day, our family, uh, we took a hike up to the Devil's Head Lookout Tower up there. I don't know if you've ever gone up there, but they've got this like forest ranger station and they like search for forest fires like by hand, you know, and then they like call them in if they see something. Uh, but there's all these steps, you can go up there. Really cool, but the hike is nice. It's just a few miles. Our whole family can do it. Um, now we don't take Oakley in a backpack. He's uh, running along up the way and then kind of dragged along back down, <laughs> depending on what time we go. Uh, but one thing I, I've come to appreciate, in Colorado, you go to a trailhead, and there's multiple different paths. You know, it's like there's usually a map, and, you know, they're color-coded, and you can go this way or this way, or if you want to go further, you can go this way. Like, there was, uh, when we were in seminary, there was a favorite spot that we, uh, we liked in the foothills uh, where you could go, and there's multiple different trails, and we'd always just go kind of like 30 minutes in, and then, that, and then you got to go back. This is before we had Oakley and Carter and Quentin were young. Uh, and then I remember the first time we could actually make a loop. It's like we had enough stamina, we could, we could actually do like one of the trails. And then I remember going back after we had moved, and we climbed all the way to one of the peaks. Um, and that was a big, uh, difficult event for our kids that we, uh, we got them through together. Uh, another one that we did earlier this summer was down in Colorado Springs. There's this Mount Muskoko right by Mount Culver, I think. Uh, Cutler? And we, we, had, we had climbed Mount Cutler before. It was a shorter one, and we wanted to do the other path that went forward. And it was awesome because we, we had to prepare our kids. Hey, we're doing the longer one. You know, like when, when we take that fork, we're actually going to go uh, the, the farther fork in the higher mountain and, and kind of get them prepared because you're sharing the trail with all sorts of other people. Some are going this way. Others are going this way. But they knew when we got to the fork, here's where it is, and Quentin runs off and he checks. Yep, this is the one. All right, come this way, and off we go. It's important to know what path you're on, because then you'll know which forks to take. You know, in our life, there's all sorts of paths that we can take, just like a Colorado trailhead, uh, but you get to choose which path are we on. Uh, for, for us here at church, or I'll speak for myself, and you can decide whether or not you're with us, uh, but if you choose to follow Jesus, that's your path. Not everyone's on that in the world, right? Some people are going this way, and some people are going that way. What is the distinctiveness about this path? What's the trail marker? What can you see that says, well, this is definitely different than over there? Well, we, go, we, we sing these songs on Sunday, you know, like other, <laughs> other people don't if they're on those paths. Um, but maybe that's, more, that's our hiking group. We all come together. What does it look like when we're walking on the path, like, out, like in our lives, right? Like as we're going, is it our language, our hobbies, our diet, our music we listen to, the clothes we wear, like, like what, what is it about our life that is different, that looks different, that is an actual different path? It's important that we, as Christ followers, choose the path of God and not just any old path. Uh, the, the Bible, oh, I, I'm just going to make a, make a claim and I'm not going to back it up because it's not where we are today, but it won't let us just take whatever path we want and bring God along. There is a path of following Jesus that's core to who we are and to following God that you can't do if you're following any other path. So how do we make sure we hit the right fork in the road and keep following him? That's what our passage is talking about today. Uh, you know, we've been, we've been going through the book of Genesis, uh, and we're at a time uh, or at a, a portion in the scripture where it's revealing what does the path of God look like versus other paths that you could take anywhere in life. Uh, what we're going to be reading today is answering the question of what makes us different. What, what, what makes us stand out? What makes us distinct from everyone else around us? So we've been looking at kind of these deep uh, existential questions, kind of who we are kind of type questions. The portion that we're at today is going to say uh, what, what, what makes our path look different and distinct from all uh, other paths. We're going to be reading Genesis chapter 9. It's verse 18 through the end. I think it's 29 is the last verse of uh, chapter 9. And this is the very last story of Noah. It's focused on Noah's sons. So they've already had the flood. The floodwaters went down. They came out. Uh, God makes a covenant with Noah. He says, I really care about you guys. I really care about human life. And then this is the very last scene that we see of Noah and his family. Uh, and it sets up the entire rest of Genesis. So chapter 10, we're not going to do a sermon on chapter 10. Uh, it has genealogies, but the important part is it's attaching 
the sons of Noah to the different nations around the world. So when this is written down and there's a, a people of Israel and they're wanting to know who are we or what makes us different, um, they can look back at these passages and see, oh, here's all the other nations around us and they draw from this, uh, this son, from this son, from this son. The story of the three sons is setting up who are these nations and who are we, which path are we on. Let's read it all together, and then I'll explain it further once we have some more context. All right, this is uh, chapter 9, verses 18 all the way down to 29. The sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These were the three sons of Noah, and from them came the people who were scattered over the whole earth. Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. Then they walked in backwards and covered their father's naked body. Their faces were turned the other way so that they would not see their father naked. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves, will he be to his brothers. He also said, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend Yafet's territory. May Yafet live in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be the slave of Yafet. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. Noah lived a total of 950 years. And then he died. All right, we, I just have to say it. You read that, and it feels very foreign, <laughs> very archaic. You know, I know of no one who curses their sons with kind of these generational curses. Uh, no one that I know tells one, one son to be the slave of the other. You know, usually when my sons are fighting, I try to bring in some equality, <laughs> you know, and uh, try not to have uh, one have power over the other. Uh, but then, then you have the whole event, like, so what did Ham do? Like, wait, why was, why was Noah so mad at him? What's, what was Noah doing? <laughs> you know, like, there are so many, uh, I think, unfamiliar questions that we bring to this passage, that we bring to this text. Uh, and they're, they're very valid questions, but I do want to frame it what is this passage saying? And, and when you look at chapter 10 and you see, you know, all of the nations that are coming from it, that this whole passage is, is introduced by these were the three sons of Noah and from them came the people who were scattered over the whole earth. It is telling a story of the past that is bearing on the reality now. If you're a nation, if you're Israel, you are, you're going to be on, in the line of Shem. That's going to be the line. Ten generations down from Shem comes Abraham or Abram, and that's the one that God calls, and uh, we're not going to get it into this sermon series. Maybe, maybe next summer we can do like a Genesis part two or some, some sort of series. Uh, but you feel like you're in the line of Shem. And so when you read this story, you say, okay, I am like Shem. And so how Shem goes, that's how I go. He set the path, and that's the path that I'm going to follow. And you look at Ham and Yafet, and you say, those are these other nations around me. We are different than them because we act differently. The difference is the path. We are different because of the path we take. So we are different as Christians, not because we are saying we're Christians, not just because we're showing up on Sunday, uh, not because we have a cross necklace, you know, or a bumper sticker that says I love Jesus or whatever it is. It's the actual path we're walking. It's because we are following Jesus. He's the one that led us the path and we're not following other paths. The same way. How, are you, how do you know who you are? If you're ancient Israel reading this, you're in the line of Shem, and Shem does things in this way. He's setting the path in this story. So we can talk about the, uh, the details, we can talk about maybe our questions, but understand that there's this concept in Genesis called corporate solidarity. That's, that's what the theologians call it. I don't know, there's probably a better word we can come up with, uh, but they didn't ask us, right? Corporate solidarity means that the path that the Father has set leads the entire family in that direction. And so when we see these genealogies, we were talking about this with, with Cain and his descendants as they go down, and then you see Seth and his descendants as they go down. There's this like two paths that, that society or that the whole family is, is now following. So there's this, this sense that whatever our ancestors have blazed, what trail, that's the path that we are on. And so we see that present here. Uh, let's keep that in mind and let's dive into uh, what actually happened. Uh, first off, uh, Noah got drunk, <laughs> and then uh, he lay naked, right? And, and if you want to look for a passage that says alcohol is bad, right, 
uh, you're going to have to look further than this passage. <laughs> uh, the, the point isn't trying to say anything about alcohol here. And in fact, the Bible has lots to say about alcohol. There's uh, lots of good things about alcohol, believe it or not. It's, it, it cheers the spirit. Uh, it's appropriate for celebrating with others. Uh, there's also passages that talk about it being a vice, where uh, we, we, when we drink it too much, it actually causes moral compromise. And so there's good things and bad things and warnings and and for us that say, well, what, what am I supposed to do? Well, here's the thing. It, it, you're going to have to make a moral decision, a moral choice in how you use alcohol. And how do we know which moral choice to do? Well, what, what path are you on, right? If you're following this path, then you'll go along with it. If you're following this path, then you'll go right along with that. It's important that we know the path that we're on so that we can make these moral decisions in areas that the Bible actually leaves open to us. Uh, so I don't know if that surprised you. The Bible doesn't say wine is good, doesn't say wine is bad. Uh, it kind of says both. <laughs> so not helpful if you're a black and white kind of person. What we'll need is we'll need to know guidance on the path to make these moral decisions. Uh, here, though, uh, Noah is not portrayed as using it well. Uh, it actually kind of sets the scene for this sin to happen, for Ham to act the way he did. All right, here's what Ham did. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. And that's it. It's like very simple. So I don't know about you. When I read this, I'm like, sounds fine. To, sounds fine to me, right? Like I could imagine, like, whoa, oh, dude, nose naked. You guys probably don't want to talk to dad. You know, at this point, you know, it just seems like that's an appropriate response, right? Uh, it's not an appropriate response if you look at what happens. And Noah gets very mad. Uh, you're not the first person to wrestle with, yeah, but what actually happened here? So the kind of the Jewish interpretation of this story adds details in order to further say what Ham did because what the text says doesn't really say he did anything. <laughs> you know, it doesn't seem like there was anything wrong. Uh, I think it's a dangerous game to play to say, oh, what the Bible's saying without really saying it is the, the, you're, you're adding to the scripture. This is all we have uh, and it's all we need uh, to understand what's going on here. I want to introduce a concept, a perspective that uh, we don't think of, uh, at least from our culture, but is present here in Genesis. There's a, a spiritual aspect to nakedness in Genesis, right? So if, you, if you're, again, if you're just reading through Genesis to understand who God is and you get to this passage and you see that Noah is laying there naked in his tent, where else have we seen nakedness in the Bible? It, it comes up in the garden, yeah. So at the end of chapter two, there's this divine marriage and Eve is created from Adam's rib, and Eve is presented to Adam. Adam says, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. You know, and, and, and they, they're married, they're united, and it says one comment, almost a throwaway line. They're both naked, and they had no shame. You know, okay, cool, yeah, sounds good. You know, like, everything's harmonious. This is before sin enters the garden. The author, whoever wrote this down, the oral tradition says it's important that you know that they were naked, and there's no shame nakedness reappears in the next chapter. Also in maybe an out-of-place thought for us. The next chapter is about when Adam and Eve choose to eat from the tree that God said, don't eat from that tree. They do it. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It says their eyes were opened when they ate from this fruit. They, they, they had knowledge now of good and evil. And what was the thing that they saw? That they were naked. naked. I mean, why, why can't you see anything else? Is there nothing other other moral element that you can now have this knowledge of good and evil of. No, but they were naked. It was the very first thing that the author, that the story says that they realized once they had sinned. Once they had possessed that knowledge of themselves, they said, uh-oh. And now they had shame. They covered themselves. It said they sewed fig leaves together in order to cover themselves. They said, this isn't good. I'm not supposed to be naked. Before, before they had sinned, they were naked, they felt no shame. The Bible wants us to see this, right? After sin, they were naked, they felt shame. And they felt, I need, I, I can't, I shouldn't be naked, right? Nakedness is a physical metaphor of our spiritual purity before God. Like there's, there's a theme here, right? When, we, when we're pure and we can present ourselves to God, there's no shame. There's innocence, right? I'm, hey, I'm just me. And God says, yes, absolutely. When we lose our innocence, when we take this knowledge of good and evil for ourselves, now nakedness means we're exposed and we're vulnerable. No longer is it innocent because we're guilty, and so we say, you know what, I, I am guilty. And it's actually a proper recognition that I am guilty to cover yourself. That's normal. W when God finds them in the garden, he confronts Adam and Eve. He 
says, hey, what, what, did you eat from the tree? They say, yes, we did. They confess. And God gives them curses. But before he banishes them out of the garden, what does he do? He closes them. He says, it's actually right for you now to be clothed, right? He's, he's saying, we, we can't go back to you being innocent, right? He, he doesn't say, it's okay, there's no shame. Now that you've done it, I understand, I forgive you. Yeah, yeah, all of that's there, but, but it's proper now that you're clothed. In fact, he makes better clothing than they, than they made for themselves. Nakedness represents our guilt. Well, it, it's our innocence before God, but now we're not innocent anymore. And so nakedness is not just inappropriate, it's shameful for us. Because what are we declaring if we stand naked before others? I'm innocent. I'm pure. God can't judge me. He's wrong. If he thinks that I've done right, no, no, he's wrong. I'm, I'm pure. I'm good. I'm right. And God's saying, no, 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 no. You're sinned. You're sinful. You're broken. You need covering. That's appropriate because you are not holy anymore. You are not perfect. You are not dependent on me. You're independent. Therefore, you should, you should be covered. Now, again, this is a concept, I don't know, I, I, I haven't heard from our culture, but it's present in Genesis, where nakedness is in not just an appropriate state, it's shameful to God. Because if there's Noah, who's a righteous man, the, the Bible has been very careful to tell us that he is doing things right. And there he is, lying naked. That's, that's not just, ah, oh, okay, put something on. No, it's like, no, you're, you're saying something wrong, Noah. You can't, don't, don't say... I'm innocent. Cover up. Cover up. Right? Because you know who God is. God knows who you are, and you're not okay. We need to be covered. So when Ham goes in there, sees Noah, what does he do? He, he denies that there's anything wrong. Doesn't do anything about it, and he tells others. He magnifies Noah's shame. Right? Whoa. Did you know that he's, yeah, he's naked, right? He's, he's in an open state of rebellion against God. I mean, is, is, is what's implied within here. And then you see the difference between what Ham does and what Shem and Yafet do. Shem and Yafet cover him because that honors what God has said, that we should be clothed in our current state. We are not innocent. We are not free from being judged by God. Nope. Where we are, we need clothes. So what Ham is doing is, is several things. There's several seeds where he's gone wrong. One, he's not respecting his father. He's not seeing him. He's not seeing him with any sort of compassion or an estate and saying, oh, let me cover you. Here, let me take care of that. Yeah, you're, you're out of place from what you say you believe, from the path that you're on. You strayed from the path. Let me bring you back. He leaves him there, right? He disrespects the person. God has just said, I value human life. And Ham's kind of saying, ah, whatever. That's his problem, not mine. You know, like he doesn't share that same value as him. He's also saying, I don't value what God has said about the appropriateness of nakedness or what God said is good, right, and true. I'll just let things that aren't good, right, and true just be as they are. It doesn't take any action. We talked about Adam. His commissioning was to maintain the world, maintain the beauty, maintain the sacredness. Ham is rejecting that commission. I'll just do whatever I want. And, and he is repeating the, the sin of the garden and saying, I'll do what I want. doesn't really matter what God wants. There's moral compromise. Uh, what, whatever uh, was going on in his mind, he's choosing his way uh, and not following God's way. There's a rabbit trail we can jump down <laughs> that, that we need to and talk about how can we, th this is the path of Ham. Where do we see this path in our life? It's all over. These are, these are the other paths, right? People that aren't following God, aren't following Jesus' way, they take other paths and it looks like what Ham is doing where they say, I won't necessarily respect other people. I'll just look out for myself, right? So any anytime, anytime that you are operating with yourself first, others later, not having compassion on how that's going to impact others, that's the path of Ham. Uh, for example, if you don't have compassion on people or if you want to make them pay uh, or if, well, they, they deserve that, you know, any anytime, right? You know, so I won't let them in because, well, they cut me off back there or whatever, or um, I won't, Smile at them because they don't smile at me. Whenever you're trying to make someone else feel vengeance from you or get what they want, what you're essentially doing is saying, I don't respect them the same way I respect myself. Or if you raise your voice to intimidate and let them feel your wrath to try to bend them, you're essentially saying, they don't deserve my respect to talk to them as I would want to be talked to. This is the path of Ham where you're saying, me first, I don't respect others, uh, I'll push them down. Uh, also, what, what Ham is doing is he's saying, 
uh, I'll do it my way, irrespective of what God's way is. I don't know if Ham knew. Uh, it sure seems like he knew and he chose not to. Uh, but there's all sorts of justifications that people use on these paths over here uh, in order to do things that others might say, I don't know about that. You know, things like that. Here's keywords. Uh, it won't hurt anyone, <laughs> right? Or, uh, well, I won't act on it. I'm just thinking it. Or you say, well, they're okay with it. You know, you have all these different excuses to justify perhaps morally impermissible behavior. Or, or maybe it's just behavior that people are like, huh, are you sure you should do that? No one's going to get hurt. When we say these things, we're following the path of Ham. Because we're saying there is no standard that I have to follow. I'll just do what I want. And, and, that's, and that's fine, right? Well, <laughs> if you're over here on this path, but if you're on Shim's path, that's not fine. Because there is actually a right and a wrong. And then we have to see Ham is not understanding the spiritual significance of nakedness. Now, I, I want us to actually really think about this. Is there a spiritual sense to nakedness? Uh, in particular, public nakedness. You know, I'm not saying we can't shower, you know. But is there something to be said where we should be clothed when we're seen by others? That we don't accidentally say, I'm innocent before God, no one can judge me. Because that spirit is actually present in our world and in our world that says I can wear whatever I want right you can't tell me what to do there's no moral authority to tell me I do what I want no one can judge me and if you're judging me well that's your problem not my problem what if there is actually a spiritual sense that says we shouldn't be exposed we're actually meant to be clothed <laughs> I mean th to me that gives a way better argument for modesty than the one that I heard growing up you don't want someone else to be tempted by what you're wearing or you're not wearing? What if it was the more skin that you're showing, the more you're over here declaring your independence from God, declaring that he is wrong and that you're actually morally justified before God? Whereas the modest route says, no, it's actually appropriate for me <laughs> to, to be clothed because I am not holy. I am not pure. I'm actually relying on someone else, in this case, Jesus, for that purity. Or if you want to look at a, a biblical basis for Christians to be against pornography of all kinds, here it is. I don't care if it's consensual. I don't care if they uh, want it, if, it's, if they think it's okay. We'd have to say there's something improper, not just improper, shameful, right, that goes against what God has said is right and wrong if there is public nakedness. Ah, we can jump ah, rabbit trails all the way down <laughs> if we want to, but, but I think our world doesn't have an understanding of any sort of spiritual sense of nakedness, but it's there. It's present in Genesis. It keeps popping up in Genesis, again, in the part two of our series that we'll pick up summer 2025, you know, as we see it go on. But there's something to be said. It's appropriate for us to stay clothed. It's appropriate for us to be modest. It's not just traditionalist. It's not just people that are backwards or ancient times. It, it actually aligns with God's character. But again, the point of this isn't to try to say... Uh, what Ham did wrong, it's the difference between Ham and his brothers. Let's jump there. This is the path that the, the audience would be following, not Ham's path. They recognize, no, that's, that's wrong. That leads to all sorts of things. If you're going to follow your own moral justification, not have an authority, if you're going to belittle others, disrespect others, if you don't understand the spiritual significance of nakedness, yeah, you're going to do all sorts of things that are wrong. You know, like, I mean, we can only imagine, right? I mean, we can only look out our windows and just see other paths. This is the path that we're supposed to be on. But Shem and Yafet took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. Then they walked in backward and covered their father's naked body. Their faces were turned the other way so that they would not see their father naked. Uh, you see a lot more detail in what Shem and Yafet's actions were. Uh, they're the highlight. They're, they're what we're supposed to be focusing on, not Ham. So there, there's meant to be questions. What, what actually was Ham? Was it, was it his thoughts? Did he do something else? No. This is what we're supposed to look at. Shem and Yafet's actions. What they're doing is they're demonstrating the opposite of what Ham was doing. So instead of disrespecting their father, they respect their father. They recognize he's in a state that he doesn't want to be in. He's perhaps saying things uh, about spiritual realities that he doesn't want to say, we need to cover him, right? He's off the path. He's in danger, right? Or he's going the other way. We need to bring him back onto the path. It, sh it shows care. This shows compassion, to others. This is what we're called to do. This is what the path of Shem looks like. They also respect God's truth. 
You know, they, they aren't trying to say, well, it's fine. I mean, he got drunk. You know, like, what do you expect? You know, let's just, let's just give him a chance in the morning, you know, wake up and deal with it. No, no, no. Let's, let's align ourselves with God's truth right now. Uh, we, we don't have to make excuses or make compromises. There is a truth, so we are going to live in that truth. That's the path of Shem. And then lastly, uh, they deny themselves. They look the other way. They, they ensure that they won't also join Noah in this path. If, if they're concerned he's on the wrong path, uh, they're going to take precautions that they don't, oh, yeah, you're right, I guess we'll just stay. No, 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 no. We're going to stay focused on the path that we have. And so we see these seeds that are planted, respecting others, respecting God's truth, and denying yourself. This is the markers of Shim's path, the markers that make us different from the world. The, the world doesn't do this all the time, consistently. Shim's path does consistently. And, and this is repeated as you go through the Bible. As God further reveals himself to his people, respect others. That sounds a lot like love your neighbor as yourself. Respect God's truth. Uh, it's also love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Uh, Jesus uh, repeated those as the, uh, the greatest commandments. And he said you have to uh, choose to follow me, and that means denying yourself, dying to yourself, picking up your cross daily. Uh, these are seeds here in Shem's path that blossom and grow full as we get through the rest of the Bible. And so us, too, we can see this. But we also want to be on the good path and not be on the world. If we're following God, we're following Jesus, it will also look like this, respecting others, respecting God's truth, denying yourself. It reminds me of Galatians 6.1, uh, which talks about how should we be acting with each other if, if we find someone is maybe over there, <laughs> right? Like we know the path is over here, and it, it's just a little bit, right? It's just, uh, but it's not this path, right? What do we do? This is what Paul writes. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. I feel like the best picture of this is Shem and Yafet. Just gently, just a blanket. Don't, don't have to make a big deal about it. We'll cover them, and we go. We don't even look. We don't magnify it. You know, like, you know what this means? If someone is struggling with something, we don't blab, <laughs> right? Ham blabs and, and escalates the shame, escalates their sin. So now it's public. So now everyone can see it, right? So if they're making a statement with their lives that I'm rejecting God or I'm not living according to his truth, uh, they're, they're hypocritical, maybe based on what they're saying with their mouth and what they're saying with their life, we don't tell other people about that. We just bring them back gently calmly, uh, carefully, <laughs> right, so that we don't also fall into temptation. That's the path that Shem and Yafet are demonstrating for us. These three things, we should challenge ourselves. Do our lives look different from other paths in how we respect others? This is how we love others. Are Christians really caring more about other people or giving respect where others do not give respect? We should be. Are we really respecting God's truth and saying, no, this is what God has said, therefore we will be here. Other people can be on other roads, but we will be here. Are we, are we excellent at denying ourselves and saying, you know what, what I want to do is not as important as what God wants. Do we demonstrate discipline in our lives more so than other people? This is the distinction, the path that we are on that we can have. What I like what I want us to think about is uh, those curses. Uh, he ends up saying to all three, I mean, he curses Ham. He really curses Ham's son, Canaan, uh, who is the primary uh, next-door neighbor to Israel, the primary culture they're trying to be distinct from. So when they read this, they see, oh, yeah, we are not like them. We are ourselves. But he also says positive things to the others. He says this to Shem, praise be to the Lord, the God of Shem. Noah recognizes that that path is, is God's. It, you know, God has made a covenant to Noah, to all the earth. And then I said it gets more and more specific as we go further. That covenant goes through the line of Shem, hits Abraham, hits Moses, hits David, hits Jesus. That is the line of Shem, the God of Shem, because they have chosen, or he has blazed the path that is pointed toward God. God says, yes. Those are my people. That's my path. I want to challenge all of us 
uh, you get to pick your path. How different do you want to be? If you're in, choose the path of Shem. Be distinctive in that. And also take that concept of corporate solidarity with you. You're not just choosing your path. You're part of something bigger. You are blazing a trail for everyone who's coming behind you. Whether it's your family, your kids, your grandkids, whether it's your community, your friends, your coworkers, whoever it is, what you choose is not just your path. You are setting an example for everyone behind you to follow. So pick your path. Choose Shem. <laughs> it's the good one. Be distinctive the way that God has called us to be distinctive. Let's pray. God, I thank you for how you've revealed yourself to us. I even thank you for this story that gives us little seeds for your morality that shows what is good in your eyes. I pray that we would see the opportunities to do this in our own life and that we'd be able to interpret this properly for our current present day and age. I pray that you would give us gentleness to restore one another. I pray that we wouldn't just let people flounder on the side of roads, but we carefully restore them. And I pray that we would want to be unique, that we would enjoy taking the right forks in the road in order that we might go to the destination that leads to you. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness. And in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Uh, one of my favorite threads uh, that comes through this passage uh, has to do with the, the kind of repeat of Adam in Noah. You know, we talked last week that there's this, this flood and this recreation. Um, there's, there's, you know, di different words that connect us back to Genesis 1. Uh, Adam had three sons. He had Abel, he had Cain, and he had Seth. Abel was the good one following this path. Uh, Cain was the bad one following this path. Uh, and Seth is kind of the replacement uh, for Abel, right? Cain kills his brother Abel, uh, but Seth follows, and that becomes the path of God's chosen. Noah also has three sons. He's got Ham over here, Shem over here, and then there's Japheth. <laughs> he kind of gets lost in the shuffle, you know? Uh, if you look at the table of nations, Ham ends up being uh, all of the enemies of Israel. It's Egypt, it's Philistia, it's Canaan, it's Assyria, it's Babylon. All the peoples that are opposed to Israel, those are following the past that don't follow God. It's just Shem that follows God. And then you have Japheth. Yafet moved far away to the north, you know, the peoples that would one day be the Greek and the Roman empires, and Israel didn't have a lot of influence with them. Uh, but we see that they're the Gentiles. The New Testament, after Jesus, it's the Gentiles who are given this opportunity to be grafted in to the line of Shem. <laughs> they get to be the replacement. You know, Paul even says this in Romans, when all of Shem's line rejected Jesus as the Savior, it opened the door so all of Yafet's line could join Shem. Yafet, still walking in righteousness, now can be a part of God's chosen people. And what I love, love, love about this line, this is what Noah says to Yafet. May God extend Yafet's territory. May Yafet live in the tents of Shem. What God has created for Shem, his people, the ethnic Jews, and said, they will be my people. Yafet is invited to live in that house, in that place. May we join. So Yafet, who's the Gentiles, I don't know if there's any Jews in here that would be from Shem's line, uh, we also have that opportunity to follow the path. Uh, it's talking way more than ethnicity here. Uh, don't, don't get caught in, well, I'm this line, I'm that line. There's an open invitation with Jesus to be a part of the good line, the Shem line, the line that leads to God, that God says, those are my people, and the people say, this is my God. It happens here <laughs> at the table. This is communion. This is where we are clothed in Jesus' righteousness, in appropriate clothing, not just for us, but in pure clothing so that we can stand before God and be pure because of Jesus' death on the cross. This is the invitation that we accept so that we can be grafted in, so that we can live in the tents of Shem. At the table, I'd say something magical happens, something spiritual happens, right? Where it's no longer just our choice and what path we take, but we are filled with God's righteousness. We have Jesus inside of us to walk on the path that makes us distinct from others. So when we take communion this morning, I want you to think about 
what's happening. <laughs> that you're being empowered to walk the path that is distinct from all other paths. You're humble, you're laid bare. It's not even your own choice. It's just your acceptance of what Jesus has already done on the cross. So as always, we'll take a few moments. We've got the one loaf, gluten and nut free, that we can all share, representing Jesus' body broken for us. And we have the one cup, it's grape juice, that represents Jesus' blood that was shed for us, that is this new covenant that we enter into in Jesus. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread after he gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant which is in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So take time in prayer at your seat. And when you're ready, come up and take communion.
Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your invitation to the house that you built for your people of Israel. And thank you for your path. Thank you for your empowerment that we might walk on the path. Thank you for your grace and love which show us how we are to walk that path. Lord, fill each one of us. Fill our church with your spirit, with your goodness, with your truth, with the desire to walk in the path of you. That we be distinct from others. May others see the differences of how we walk. And may we also extend the invitation that was extended to us in order that we might walk the path uh, that feels impossible to walk on our own, God. But through you, we have it. We love you, Lord. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Excellent. We've got questions, as we do, to try to take some of these principles we talked about and apply them in life. I uh, want to keep pointing out the rules. <clears throat> you can talk about them or look at them or read them when uh, you're, you're bored during the meet and greet time and you don't want to talk to anyone else. Uh, the, the concept, the thought, is that we'd be practicing this gentleness, that we would be fostering an environment that is very warm, welcoming, that then makes it easy if someone is straying the path for us to gently welcome them back in. So practice being gentle, practice being loving while holding to God's truth. All right, here's the questions we got. How does the world see Christians as different and is this good or bad? So you don't have to just say the good things. You can say bad things. But how, how do you think the world perceives Christians as different? And is that the right, right or wrong way we want? Uh, two is how should our lives look different in following Shem and Yafet's example. That's respecting others, respecting God's truth, and denying ourselves. Uh, what's practical ways, maybe hypothetical ways, what should this look like in our life? And then give an example of how you might restore someone gently. What should this look like? Uh, again, it doesn't have to be a real story. Uh, what might that look like if someone is on a path that is not the righteous path? How can we do it uh, maintaining their respect, their honor, God's truth, uh, and doing it gently in love? Uh, talk with each other. Uh, feel free to take as long as you'd like. But whenever you feel like, all right, we're kind of ready, you guys can leave. Let me dismiss, dismiss you now so you don't feel like you've got to wait for me to do it. But as you go this week, choose the path of Shem, which is the path of Jesus. It's the path of God's love for us. Go in the Lord's peace. All right, let's discuss.